Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sarah's event on sustainability and food. Uh, we all know that food is uh, a huge issue when it comes to sustainability, especially in climate change. Um, represents at least 10% of our emissions, uh, and there are some big questions about the progress that we can make on climate change without tackling this big food question. So we have a range of really good speakers today. Um, I will introduce them a little bit more um, as they give uh, their short introductory speeches. Um, but just to kind of summarize very quickly, we've got Sue Heyman uh, here on my left, um, who is the Shadow Secretary of State for uh, DEFRA. We've got Sue Davis, Head of Campaigns. Sue Pritchard. Oh, sorry, apologies, <laughs> wrong side, wrong <laughs> side. Sue Pritchard, Director of Food uh, Farming um, at the, at the uh, Countryside Commission. We've got uh, Ben Reynolds. Deputy Executive for Sustain, uh, Louise Davis, Head of Campaigns for the Vegan Society, and at the far end, uh, Dr. Helen Harwatt, uh, Animal Law and Policy Fellow at Harvard Law School. So if I can ask, please, for Sue Pritchard to get us started, she's going to tell us just a little bit on uh, the importance and the need for sustainable food systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here. I've come hot foot from Wales, where I uh, also run um, a small family farm, an organic permaculture pasture for life farm. Um, so that also informs perhaps some of the comments I'm going to make today, as well as the work that we've done over the last two years in the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And we have now published our reports, which I think are very beautiful. I think beauty does matter. Um, we brought a few copies here with us, but um, just trying to limit what we're carrying and the amount of paper we're leaving lying around, you can also download them if you'd like to read them. The, the commission was a, a two-year independent inquiry uh, funded by the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and run out of the RSA in London, the Royal Society for Arts, uh, Manufacturers and Commerce. Set up um, a couple of years ago, following the Brexit vote, a group of uh, industry, business and NGO leaders got together and realised very quickly that the implications of that vote were huge across the food and the farming system. And they initially approached the government at the time to say, do we need a royal commission or a government commission to uh, look into the issues in a really serious way? Government declined. Uh, and those industry leaders decided that uh, that wasn't the right answer, and so they would organise um, an independent inquiry with some real substance behind it. So it's chaired by Surrey and Cheshire, and we have 14 other commissioners who come from a whole range of organisations in food, uh, in retail, in farming, environment, um, tourism and leisure, uh, and economics. They're a really amazing bunch of commissioners who've really held our feet to the fire in terms of how we do our work. So our mandate was to inquire into how we can design uh, safer and more secure systems for food and farming, whilst also helping to regenerate and revitalise rural communities and rural economies. But as if that mandate wasn't big enough, we spread our wings even further. We also brought in the bodies of work around public health, economics, and how we use the countryside in um, in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so some folks say you spread yourselves too thinly, that is too broad a remit to be able to focus on the critical issues. We say actually none of us live our lives in policy or academic silos. We live our lives completely capable of navigating all of the different issues in food or in farming or in health and education in rural communities. And so it, somebody has to do the work that holds that whole system in view. And that's what we've sought to do. And the other thing that I think was quite distinctive about the way that we went about our work was how, how we did our consultation, how we conducted our inquiry. We, we did all the things that an inquiry normally does. We called for evidence. We looked at the whole of the policy landscape to see what other people were saying, not just in the UK, but around the world. And we conducted a whole series of workshops with experts um, from NGOs, businesses, and so on. But we also traveled the UK on a, on a bicycle. 
And, and it was really important for us to do that. Some people are going, you did what? We did. We did exactly that. We, um, what was important to us was that instead of doing consultation in the way that it is often done, kind of inviting people to rather grim hotels on the edges of towns at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday night and asking them to sit round tables with post-its and sticky dots and then wondering why people just don't turn up because they've got better things to do. We would just go out to speak to people where they are, in their homes, in their businesses, in their communities, on farms, in community groups, in schools. And uh, it took us nine months, and 27 cyclists, 27 researchers did the work. And we generated an enormous amount of data, really fascinating and extraordinary data, that tells the story of how people are feeling in their communities right now, but it also tells the story about what people are already doing to tackle some of the critical issues that we're facing. So I'm going to whiz quickly through, um, mindful of time, to what all that culminated in. Although this commission was set up to deal with the huge questions brought about by the Brexit vote, we very quickly realised that the issues we needed to deal with transcend Brexit. Climate, the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the crisis in public health, the enormous rise in diet-related illnesses, and the way our rural communities are feeling disconnected from policies that affect them. We came up with 15 recommendations in three groups, three buckets. The first is called Healthy Food is Everybody's Business. And the recommendations there are all about levelling the playing field for a fair food system. We took note of the World Health Organization's comments that, in their view, the biggest risk to public and planetary health is an unregulated global agribusiness sector. We recognise really clearly that the way that we produce food at the moment is not fair and it's not equitable. The risks are borne by many and the rewards are reaped by few and that needs to change. The second set of our recommendations are grouped under the heading farming can be a force for change. In fact, farming must be a force for change. Farmers told us on our travels that they are feeling beleaguered and actually really quite distressed, having become the bad guys in the debates about the climate crisis and the climate emergency. But the reality is, without farmers, none of, us would, none of us would be eating the snacks that we're going to be having later. None of us would have had breakfast. Without farmers, we will not have food on our plates. And farming can be a vital force for change. The right kind of farming can be a force for change. So we have recommended that farmers and other stakeholders work together to develop a transition plan to regenerative farming systems that will replenish our ecosystems, but also protect rural communities and help rural communities regenerate. Our last bucket of recommendations are called A Countryside That Works For All. And in that, we talk about the need to have some really quite serious conversations about how we use our land. That's become an incredibly polarized debate, rewilding versus agriculture or um, you know, the national parks versus sustainable in uh, intensification. That's not helping anybody. We need a better, more thoughtfully, more evidence-based, mediated conversation, not just at the policy level, which tends to centre in Whitehall and Westminster, but involves communities who very often have the really grounded knowledge that's needed to make these conversations sustainable and robust. And in that set of um, recommendations, we also talk about the skills that we need for a regenerative economy. Very often, the skills debate in the countryside or in the food and farming sector focuses on what industry needs. We ask, what does the world need from us right now? What are the skills we need to grow and develop and sustain for a more regenerative future? And lastly, we talk about a national nature service. We are all, I think, inspired by the incredible energy that young people are bringing to hold us to account for the decisions that we're making right now. 
and we think there are things that they can do. It's great that they are on the streets outside Parliament. Tragically, government's not there to listen to them. But it's, there, there are many, many other things that we think young people can do and would like to do to help us really kickstart the transition we need for climate and nature-friendly agriculture. I'll pause there. Thank you, Sue. Um, second speaker, we have uh, Sue Heyman, who is the Shadow Secretary of State for DEFRA. She's been uh, MP for uh, Workington since 2015, um, and she's also the chair of the Parliamentary Choir, something I didn't know. <laughs> so Sue's going to tell us uh, a little bit about uh, Labour's vision for sustainable food policy. Is it working? Yes. I'll stand up so people at the back can, can see me. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. And I'd like to start actually by congratulating Sue and the RSA for this report. If you haven't read it, and I have, you've sent me about six copies. <laughs> it, it really is. It's, it's a good read. because, And actually, it is, it is done differently. It talks much more about personal experiences. And I, I thought it was extremely, extremely interesting. But, I mean, clearly we are in the grip of a climate and environment emergency. And we all know that we have to take urgent acts, you know, action now to try and stop this escalating any further. So I was really proud when uh, we brought a motion from the uh, opposition, from the Labour Party in Parliament, to get government to declare a climate and environment emergency. And we gave the government a six-month deadline to come forward with a plan on that because the motion recognised the devastating impact um, that this kind of volatile and extreme weather that we're seeing uh, from climate change can have on things like our food production, our water availability, all really key to you know, moving forward um, if, if we're going to manage responsibly and sustainably the way we produce our food and the way we farm in the future. So that six months expires on the 31st of October. <laughs> when that date was set on the 1st of May, we had no idea that Brexit was going to get in the way of this. So the government has agreed to come up with a plan by the 1st of November. Now, I think they're probably a bit busy with other things at the moment, and of course it isn't the same government that agreed to do it. So we'll have to see what happens. But it is intensely frustrating being in Parliament, seeing Brexit, getting in the way and upsetting all the things that we're trying to achieve, including tackling climate change and looking at what we need to do to do that. And clearly the way we farm and the way we produce our food is absolutely key to that. So... What we did last year, I don't know if anybody remembers it, but at a conference last year, we published um, our green transformation document, which had a year ago our policies and priorities in uh, what we would do to try and tackle the climate and environment emergency. So, um, and what we're also now doing is building on that. So, Angela Rayner, our Shadow Environment Secretary, has committed to make this part of the curriculum that education is really important. And when you look at the lack of um, cookery skills, for example, the lack of understanding about where our food comes from, if we are going to tackle um, what we need to do, then children and adults as well need to understand better our current food systems and what they can do to, to, to help you know, change this as we, as we move forward, but also to understand why we need to change. Um, so there's been some excellent work done, as I said, by the Food and Farming Commission. And as the uh, Shadow DEFRA Secretary, these kinds of reports are incredibly helpful to me because I have two members of staff helping me. I don't have a lot of civil servants. So the NGOs and the work done by other groups, I just want to, I seriously want to thank you and for people here as well and Sarah because it, it does genuinely make me um, able to do my job an awful lot better <laughs> and more easily. Now, I'm not sure if you're, if you're going to be here on Tuesday, but on Tuesday we've got the big Environment Day in, um, on the floor of the House and in the conference centre. And I will be uh, closing the morning session, and what I will be speaking about is food. 
So there will be some announcements coming on food on Tuesday at the end of the morning session. So if you're interested and you can get there, um, it would be fantastic to see to see as many people there as possible. Because we have to we have to really get a clear strategy on how we are going to move forward with food. It's not just about how do we farm and how do we produce, but how do people eat? How do people make decisions about their food? And also, how much is wasted? We, we know that food waste contributes enormously to carbon emissions. We know that farming contributes enormously to carbon emissions. And I'm really pleased that the NFU have understood this. And I've been working closely with the NFU and other organisations um, because they have now set a net zero target, the NFU for farming, which is, I think, a huge step forward. So I think I've probably said enough now. But it's just, re it's just so that you know we are taking this very, very seriously as are the NFU and other farming organisations. And we'll see where we go, hopefully, get Brexit discussions out of the way and move forward. But Brexit is a challenge and I think has some serious implications. So we have to do it within that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And exciting about possible announcements coming. Next, we have uh, Louise Davis. She is head of campaigns at the Vegan Society. Um, uh, she oversees the society's projects on uh, Grow Green, the Grow Green campaign, uh, which encourages a transition from animal agriculture to plant-based farming. So she's going to tell us a little bit about the Vegan Society's campaign on food. Sarah for having us um, as partner again this year and um, we worked together on a similar event last year talking about the changes needed for a sustainable food system um, and for those of you that were at that event you'll be hearing me making the same points again because very little has changed since then um, and lots of the points we've made about the need for plant-based to be part of the solution to the cri climate crisis have fallen on. Oh. Shall I start again? Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Sarah, for having us as a partner um, for the event. Um, I'd rather... Sorry. Um, yeah, so we worked on a similar event last year around sustainable food systems, um, and I'll be saying a lot of the same points as I made last year, um, because very little has changed in that year um, in terms of considering plant-based as part of the solution to the climate crisis. Um, it's quite surprising that this point is falling on deaf ears given the weight of scientific consensus around it. So since our panel a year ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have said that consistent evidence indicates that in general, a dietary pattern that is higher in plant-based foods, such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, and lower in animal-based foods is more health-promoting and associated with lower environmental impact. We've also had the Committee on Climate Change saying that changes in people's diets, if it leads to reduced UK production of products such as beef, lamb and milk, could have significant impact on emissions. And the Eat Lancet report recommended an increased consumption of plant-based foods, while in many settings substantially limiting animal source foods. So there's a large body of work has emerged now about the environmental impacts of various diets, and most of these studies have concluded that a diet rich in plant-based foods and with fewer animal source foods will result in both improved health and environmental benefits. But then in contrast to this, last week we had the Welsh Environment Minister, the Labour Minister, saying that she doesn't think we need to eat less meat, and that in Wales it's very, very sustainable. We've also had the NFU saying that reducing the number of animals that they farm is a red line for them. In fact, they believe we can produce more, yet still hit the amb ambitious emission reduction targets that they've set. And given there's no available technology for to reduce the inherent emissions of ruminant animals, it's simply unrealistic. But more people are eating plant-based despite the lack of any incentives. Mintel report that sales of the meat-free market are forecast to increase by 44% over the next five years. So as it stands, there's a situation which we could have where we're producing food that people don't want to eat, it's, that's bad for the environment, that the scientific community are saying we shouldn't produce, and certainly for the next five years we'll be paying for it through the subsidy system too. Of course the food system is incredibly complex and different types of farming, animal farming, have different impacts. And we hear a lot about the benefits of grass-fed cattle, 
but those benefits have been disproven by the Food Climate Research Network's Grazed and Confused report. They looked at whether grazing ruminants could help sequester carbon in the soil, and if so, to what extent this might compensate for their methane emissions, and their answer was not much. That said, farmers do, of course, do a lot, of su lot to support biodiversity, protect our land, and put food on our tables. I'm simply suggesting that that food should be different. So the Vegan Society's Grow Green campaign makes the case for a shift from animal agriculture to plant protein agriculture. And we talk specifically about the benefits of pulses, so peas, beans, and legumes, which are nutritionally valuable and will be an ideal source of protein if people are to reduce their meat intake. They're also great for iron and fiber content. Pulses have a host of environmental benefits. They're nitrogen-fixing crops, so they take nitrogen from the air and deposit it in the soil, so resource-intensive nitrogen fertilizers aren't usually required. So by transitioning away from animal proteins and towards protein crops, we will be reducing methane emissions, reducing water use, and respecting animal rights. We could certainly be growing a lot more crops for human consumption on our land than we currently do, but of course not all land is suitable for growing things like pulses. And this is where we need to look at reforestation and rewilding. Much of our land would naturally be ancient woodland, but currently 87% of the UK is unwooded. There are rare pieces of land which have been grazed for hundreds of years and, ha and contain unusual biodiversity mixes, but these could be retained by free-living animals. As I say, all of this is very complicated, and we don't expect to see an overnight transition to a plant-based world. But what we do expect is political acknowledgement of the need to support those who are ready, willing, and able to make the shift. At the Vegan Society, we, re we receive an increasing number of requests for support from animal farmers who want to use their land differently. And this is often driven by economic concerns, um, often Brexit-related, environmental worries, or an ethical realisation. And at the moment, there's no support in place for those farmers to make the shift that's so desperately needed. So we urgently need policies in place to acknowledge and support the role of plant-based in our future food system. And I hope that in events like this one, we can gain some consensus on the role of plant-based and that the Shadow Minister will take on some of our recommendations. Thank you, Louise. Next, we have uh, Ben Reynolds, who is the Deputy Chief Executive of Sustain. Ben's worked at Sustain since 2004 uh, and recently worked with Jamie Oliver uh, on a campaign to uh, encourage the government to adopt the sugary drinks tax. He was a founding member of the Sustainable Food Cities Network uh, and is a trustee of the charity school Food Matters. Ben. I'll try the, the microphone. Just, uh, is, that, is that the right volume or is that okay? Is that okay? Mike, okay. I'm hearing Mike. Stand up, stand up. Oh, oh. I'll just walk around to it. Okay, I'll go for it. Oh, cheers. Um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. This was the advice from the writer Michael Pollan um, in his book, The Food Rules, 10 years ago. I think it's a bit of dietary advice. You can't go far wrong from that. I would probably argue enjoy food rather than just eat food. But saying enjoy food, not too much doesn't quite work. Um, so how does that, as a, a, an ideology to live by, how does that work out in terms of government policy? And you know, should government have a role in the food we eat, um, you know, what we grow, who supplies it? Um, food, I think, is a really critical example of that kind of argument between nanny statism and let the market just do its thing. Uh, just to explain a little bit about Sustain before I get stuck into that. So Sustain is the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. We don't have a banner. Uh, I can't see the walls for banners. Um, so yeah, apologies. But yeah, do check us out. www.sustainweb.org. Um, and we are an alliance of about 100 uh, national civil society organizations who share our aims around creating a better food and farming system. And we do that through running lots of campaigns, projects, networks themselves of thousands of uh, amazing people, amazing enterprises and groups, including people like the Brighton & Hove Food Partnership, who are here today, um, and uh, groups all uh, through cities across the country. Um, and the, the, the sort of things we do with them are things like getting hundreds of caterers serving about one billion meals now to choose, demonstrate, to actually commit to serving demonstrably sustainable fish in their meals. 
Things like running a network of 50 plus food poverty or food power alliances, as we call them, um, trying to come up with local solutions to food poverty in cities and areas across the country. And things like setting up and running the, large, the world's largest urban food growing network in London. Uh, and around the time we set that up, um, we also worked with the Olympic Games to create the first ever major sustainable food policy for a, a major sporting event. But back to government's role trying to influence the national food policy or national policy around food is probably our, our bread and butter. So we, uh, as, as uh, um, uh, Bryn said, we ran a campaign, or we ran the campaign for a sugary drinks tax, working with people like Jamie Oliver and a gang of other experts uh, and uh, with a lot of public support. Um, and we won that despite the arguments um, around this sort of nanny state. And, and I think getting the Tories to adopt a new tax is, I like to think, quite, quite some achievement. Um, in the last few months, we've been asking questions of government around their no-deal planning around food supplies. Cue silence. Getting very little response. Just this last week, we did get a response from government. We had it on record that they are not responsible for food supply. So I'd like to ask, I'm sure Sue would like to ask, what the F does the F in DEFRA actually stand for, if not food? <laughs> they said it was the responsibility of food supply businesses. This was not the view taken by those food businesses who flagged up the likely problems that a no-deal Brexit will pose, uh, particularly for food supply for schools, things like food supply for the most vulnerable people. Um, it's, you know, this ultimately shouldn't be their responsibility. So what has this all got to do with climate? Resilience, I think, is probably one of the first things. We are in an unenviable position of becoming self-imposed world leaders in how to deal with resilience planning for the food system in the event of an emergency and large-scale disruption. It's just that unlike with climate change, we're likely to be doing that the hard way and in the next few weeks. Um, the sort of food shortages and price rises that have been predicted as we get close to this cliff uh, will be mirrored, but uh, obviously over a, a slightly longer period. We really, really need government to step up, to step in and do its job which is in the name, to govern. This issue has rightly gone up the, the, the national policy agenda, so Labour has just run their consultation on a food policy, which we look forward to seeing released soon, I hope. Uh, the Lords are doing an inquiry into food and the sort of dynamic relationship between poverty, the economy, public health and the environment. And Henry Dimbleby has been appointed to create a national food strategy as well. So in responding to these and drafting what we'd like to see in party manifestos, um, we return to the same points, the need for a holistic approach to these food issues, to see the impact on environment and health, animal welfare, and the importance of a thriving food economy and good livelihoods considered all in one. But what does this mean for climate? So just to pull out a few examples, we'd like to see a shift in farm payments, the idea of public money for public good, particularly environmental goods. Um, we'd like to see a just a support for just, just transition as these payments shift and as the market shifts to support those farmers and those producers um, who need to change. Uh, we'd like to see support for enterprises pioneering a more circular food economy, keeping value in otherwise waste ingredients and repurposing this for products like beer, smoothies, etc. Uh, we've seen some great examples of that, but that really needs to be turbocharged. Some have called for a meat tax, but first I'd say let's look at the damage caused by some animal feed, for example. Imported soy in the Amazon, areas deforested for this very purpose. This is why we should be looking to support pasture fed. Let's have a look at sort of uh, import tariffs on the most damaging forms of, of, of animal feed. We, we need to reintroduce the age-old practice of using food waste for animal feed. This was, uh, you know, uh, this was phased out for some very good reasons at the time. But let's bring it up to date and ensure that it's the right kind of waste and it's properly treated. Places like Japan and New Zealand are doing this, so let's make it happen here. And yes, things like promoting less and better, we'd argue for better meat, things like pasture-fed, things like organic. But particularly where taxpayers' money is concerned, in public meals and schools and hospitals, this should definitely be happening. I would also say there's a, a, cur like a curveball to throw in. We should make veggie the default in event catering at lunches. Um, this would be a simple thing. We could get all the funders, like National Lottery, uh, Esme Fairbairn. We could get any government money that's going out when it pays for a lunch to make sure that it's veggies the default. Let's make eating meat the kind of, the, the sort of dietary requirement that you need to specify, uh, rather than specifying for veggie. This is a simple change. If people want to eat meat, that's fine. I like to eat meat. But I certainly don't want to be eating meat that's come from God knows where, put between two bits of bread that you always see at the end of these events. I'm sure a lot of you have been to those events where you see those horrible sandwiches left at the end. Food waste is bad. Meat waste is just, oh, I'm not even going to say the word. Um, I know I need to finish up, sorry. So, uh, 
And we really need to make sure that food and farming is at the heart of Green New Deal as well. I know there's a few events on that today, and uh, we've just put a blog up on our website about that. So I'm hoping we can talk to some Labour policymakers about how food and farming could be there. So to summarise, government does indeed have a role in food and farming. Um, but beyond that, we should eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Thank you. Um, so finally, we have, finally, uh, so last but certainly not least, we have uh, Helen Wahawat, uh, an animal law and policy fellow at Harvard Law School. Helen's an international award-winning researcher uh, with specific author, uh, authorship specializing in the field of planetary health with a focus on food systems and climate change. Specifically, the role of uh, animal to plant protein shifts, something I've not heard of, but sounds really fascinating, um, and meeting climate change targets and other environmental goals. So thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks so much. This on? This? Did you switch it off? Is that okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so I'm just going to focus on some of the research that I've done or I've contributed to on the need for the UK agricultural system to shift to plant based or largely plant based in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So first of all, just a little background on the climate situation. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have shown that we need strong and rapid reductions in emissions going down to net zero by 2050 in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the emissions budget that they outline that's consistent with one and a half degrees of warming is around 12 years of our current emissions. I calculated in an article published at the end of last year in Climate Policy that um, business as usual for the livestock sector particularly would take around half of this budget by 2030 for one and a half degrees and around 37% of the emissions budget for two degrees. So we know that all sectors need to need deep transformation and there's really no business as usual for any sector at this point. So in addition to staying to that emissions budget, we also need to reduce, uh, sorry, remove large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere in order to limit warming to the goals of the Paris Agreement. So there are various options being explored for this, and all of them basically require large areas of land. Uh, there are additional issues with the high-tech options, such as the bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage in particular. And this is actually unproven at scale right now and might actually take quite a while before it becomes net negative if it is ever a feasible option given the amount of energy required in the process of that technology. So it's really high risk actually to rely on these unproven technologies to basically meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so essentially if we do that, so if we kind of wait for these technologies to become effective later on. What might happen in the meantime is temperatures rise above one and a half degrees, maybe even above two degrees. And what this could do is set in motion a range of system tipping points, which could actually lead to the loss of the coral reefs, uh, the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheet, and even maybe the Amazon rainforest and the boreal forest. So that's a really high risk situation that we want to avoid. Uh, research commissioned by the UK Department of uh, Business Energy Industrial Strategy, published last year and led by Professor Henderson from the University of Oxford, who is now the Chief Scientific Advisor for DEFRA, found that essentially um, a ramp up of reforestation across the UK is our best available option right now for removing CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. So the best option for tackling climate change in line with the precautionary principle and the equity component of the Paris Agreement, which essentially seeks to limit the impact of climate change, is steep and rapid reductions in emissions combined with large-scale reforestation. So this leads to the legitimate question of where do we actually plant all of these trees? So in the UK, as an example, 72% of all land is um, agricultural land. So we looked at, in a report that we published in April, myself and my colleague, Professor Matt Hayek, we looked at the potential for reforesting some of the UK's agricultural land. So what we found is that currently 48% of all land in the UK is occupied by animal agriculture 
And this has a relatively low nutrient output compared to its land use ratio. So we thought this would be a good starting opportunity to look at reforesting some of that land. What we found is that reforesting permanent pasture land in the UK and reforesting cropland currently used to grow animal feed crops would remove from the atmosphere the equivalent of 12 years of UK CO2 emissions. If we just reforest um, the pasture land, this would remove around nine years worth of UK CO2 emissions and has the additional advantage of keeping all of that cropland under production in order to increase the supply of nutrient-rich crops for human consumption, such as pulses, grains, and fruits and vegetables. So both of those options would actually make the UK agricultural sector net negative in emissions from currently where it's a net positive emitter. And both options provide enough calories and protein for the current UK population. So looking at what could actually be done with uh, the the cropland that's currently used to grow feed crops. So just some examples. Um, so if we take 1% of the cropland that currently grows animal feed crops, we could increase the current supply of UK um, production of pears, for example, by over 400%, raspberries by over 1,000%, tomatoes by over 200%, and pears by around, sorry, peas by 20%. And as an additional thought experiment, so if we take a third of the cropland that currently grows animal feed cropland and instead grows strawberries, this could actually provide uh, the five a day for 62 million adults for an entire year. So an, almost the population of the UK. And it's really important actually to look at reconfiguring crop production as it's currently in the UK not diverse or self-sufficient. So we currently have around seven crops um, taking up around 91% of our cropland and 55% of all cropland is currently used to grow animal feed. So this puts us in a particularly high risk situation, a situation especially as we rely pretty heavily on food imports. So around 50% of all food consumed in the UK is imported. And this increases to around 90% for fruits and vegetables. And also if we consider that more than 66% of adults in the UK currently and more than 80% of children don't eat their five a day. So it's really crucial to include such cross such sorry, <laughs> such crop shifts to um, high nutrition, human edible crops uh, in, in revised food policies, and also to include reforestation of pasture land in the UK's revised commitments to the Paris Agreement, which are due to be submitted next year, 2020. So this is really the best option on the table right now. And we have, if anyone is interested, all of the information is in this report, and we have some of those on the desk if anyone would like to grab one. It's also available electronically as well. So thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Helen. So now on to uh, the really interesting bit where we, we throw out for a few questions. Uh, we have some roving, uh, some roving mics. It would be good to get from people uh, who they are, just introduce themselves, uh, and keep, please, your comment or your question to a maximum of a minute. We've got a lot of questions already. We've lost people with hands up. Uh, we've only got half an hour. We've got a lot of speakers who will want to contribute, so please try and keep them nice and tight, uh, and we'll get through as many of them as we can. So at the beginning, can we start at the front here? Um, and we'll take them in batches of three, sorry. So please introduce yourself and, and ask your, your question. The, the, the lady, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. We'll try that. Yeah. Hiya, I'm Kira Box from Friends of the Earth. I am just wondering. Um, you know, I think I think every speaker there demonstrated that the evidence really is here that we need to move to a diet involving less meat involving better produced meat and involving a far higher proportion of plant protein in our diet, both for our own health and for the health of the climate. So my question really is, and particularly maybe to Sue, is what is your message to the Labour Party in terms of the concrete policies that, that need to be introduced and championed at national government level in order to achieve this? And, and what do you see... Um, as a post-Brexit solution for more sustainable food production and more sustainable food trade, which the UK might be able to lead. Second question at the back here. 
Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Benjamin Selwyn from the University of Sussex. I teach a course on global politics of food and the students find it very inspirational for many of the reasons that the panel was speaking about, about concrete so solutions that can be implemented quite quickly. And what is required is obviously a, a good government to do that. But there's two things that I didn't hear about. One is land reform, which is obviously crucial in this country, less than 1% own over 50% of the land. Awful situation. Uh, second of all, land reform has to be democratised. It means you know, community ownership of land, that has to be really important. And third thing is, you know, we've got lots of great ideas about welfare, like universal basic income, things like that. We have to think about decommodifying food. Food is essential for everything, obviously, and yet we are all dependent on how much money we earn in order to buy the kinds of food we need. Imagine if the government had a program of decommodifying food, making available, uh, investing in local food production of the kinds of foods that you are talking about, and giving local communities the power to buy food and have community canteens, which would restore a concept of community that everyone's desperate for. I mean, that's part of the Brexit vote. Uh, and it would also reduce food uh, miles uh, and all these kinds of things. And it also actually do quite a big thing in terms of restoring the gender balance or aiming for some gender balance. So I'd really like to hear about that. Decommodification of food is really important. Thanks. Hi, I'm Gillian Homery, Wallasey Labour Party, an eco-activist within the party, and I would like to ask how the Labour Party could uh, act to end animal suffering. At the NFU store yesterday, I was told that to tackle climate change, farmers are intending to put face masks on cows to capture the methane, which is an absolute disgrace. Yes, a disgrace. And what we need to do is the Labour Party to work with the National Farmers Union to get farmers to transition to arable farming and to, um, and to growing forests. So what, what's the Labour Party doing about that? Thank you. Thank you. Sue, do you want to start on...? Yeah, um, I have to say, I, I work very closely with the NFU and all sorts of farmers, and I've never heard anything about putting masks on cows. I'd like to see somebody try, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean... I'm not sure if you're aware, we, we recently um, launched our Animal Welfare Manifesto. I don't know if you've, you've seen that, but there is a section on uh, farming within that um, and looking at how we can uh, support farmers to move to higher animal welfare standards uh, through transitional payments, for example. And I have been working very closely, not just with the NFU, but people like the Tenant Farmers Association, for example, are on exactly this. But what, one of the things that I'm particularly concerned about, and I know farmers are, is how all our, our high standards and the standards we want to reach beyond that are likely to be completely undermined um, by the kind of trade deals that Boris Johnson and um, his government and actually the previous government through Liam Fox were trying to achieve. For example, uh, trade deals with uh, America. Um, there was a lot of talk about chlorinated chicken, but it isn't just about chlorinated chicken. And the problem that you, we will have if we're not careful is we will have substandard food coming into this country produced to not just very poor environmental standards, but very poor animal welfare standards. That food will be cheap. Um, it will be cheaper than the, the food our farmers can produce. And if we're not careful, we will end up with a two-tier system where people who don't earn very much end up eating crap, to be blunt. And people like me, who are on a nice salary, can go out and buy British and buy high standard if we want to. And that is utterly unacceptable. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to just pick up two points. Um, a, a fair and just transition, how we get from where we are now to where we need to be, and how we deal with the, the whole system of issues that, that we're, we're talking about here. We recommend in our report that farmers are involved in co-designing and co-creating the transition plan to 2030. If farmers are not involved, then it will be much, much harder to make the changes that we need in a safe and sustainable and secure way. And we also talk about funding that just transition with a National Agroecology Development Bank. I'm from the Welsh Valleys, 30 years on from the mine closures. Those valleys are still trying to deal with 
the impact of a rapid and unsustainable transition away from um, those, those particular industries. We are at risk of creating that self-same issue in the countryside if we're not really careful. The point that you made at the back, sir, I, I hope that you took that exactly from the, the beetroot bond in the report because we absolutely agree with you. We think when you start understanding the issues in the round, where our food comes from, what we grow, how we grow it, but also issues of public participation in our food system. You realize that you really can't pick off these issues one at a time and you have to think about a suite of policy proposals that hold them together. And we have in the report what we call our slightly big bonkers idea, the beetroot bond, which is essentially saying, let's provide the resources that everybody in the country needs to buy healthy, local, sustainable food from local producers. But not only do they get the money to do so, they get a vote to participate in reshaping local food systems in ways that work for them. And using any surplus that's generated to invest in the sorts of initiatives that do exactly as you suggest. Cafes for people who can't afford to eat out or um, cooking classes or my personal ambition to get free milk for every school child back in schools. <laughs> or, or dairy, dairy from sustainable sources, milk from sustainable sources. Okay, um, just briefly on the animal suffering point. I mean, I commend the work that Labour have done on the Animal Welfare Manifesto, but of course the only way we're really going to stop animal suffering for our food system is to remove animals from that food system. Um, but on the policies to um, encourage that shift to plant-based, um, we've been trying to engage with the farming community and those farmers that contact us wanting to make the shift to try and find out what support is required for them to be able to do that. Um, we need a subsidy system that favours plant-based over animal, um, animal products. Um, one of the key things is advice and knowledge. There isn't a lot of knowledge out there about what we can grow and where, so we need sort of to share the knowledge that is there from those few vegan organic plant gurus, such as Ian Tolhurst, some of you might have heard of. Um, so we need education, we need access to training, um, capital investment, because you know, there are likely to be additional costs in making that transition. Um, and certainly research and development into what we could be growing where we know we could be growing a lot more different crops as Helen said you know there's a whole bunch of stuff we could be growing in the UK but that needs some investment um, into, into seeing what's viable. Um, Ben's going to say a little bit on, on Ben's question on land reform. Mm. Yeah no I did want to respond to uh, Kira's question on uh, meat and the Labour Party policy but I've kind of gone through that a bit. Uh, Benjamin your, your question I think is really really pertinent. Um, the We don't do uh, much on land reform as such, but I think it was really notable that it was one of the questions within the Labour Party food policy. So hopefully that's something that um, that um, we'll see Labour come out with more strongly on. Um, we would certainly advocate that something like a land commission. I think when you look at what Scotland's done around land reform, I think there's probably a lot that we can learn from, from their experiences on that. Uh, and, and I think more broadly in thinking about why are we trying to... to, to, to um, uh, to reform land ownership, you look at things like county farms, which have been cut across the country, which are a brilliant way to actually support, in theory, to support new entrants into farming, which is something that we really need to see in terms of any of these policies that we're putting forward, to support the likes of things like Farm Start, Ecological Land Cooperative, those sorts of initiatives that are doing a great job at putting, uh, at getting new entrants into, farm, uh, into farming. Your other point about decommodifying food, I think is really interesting. I think, look at where we are now in terms of state provision of food and what can we do working with those existing examples to do more and to do it better. So at the moment, free school meals only serves about half, the, half of those families who are in poverty. Um, so certainly extending free school meals would be a really important start. It costs about £400 million a year, I think. Uh, this is achievable in terms of all the budget and the money that we can waste on other things. Um, things like Meals on Wheels at the, like the other end of the age spectrum. This is not a statutory um, provision. Uh, I can't think of the right term. Um, so at the moment you've got local councils which are cash-strapped, cutting them left, right and centre. So I think a third of Meals on Wheels service has been cut in the last 
three years, which is abysmal because beyond the kind of the human suffering that that leads to, um, it just doesn't make sense. You've, you've put a huge problem in terms of malnutrition onto the NHS, which costs 10 times as much to kind of pick up there than it would do if that budget was given to local authorities uh, and that the remit was given to local authorities to say, do meals on wheels and do it properly. All right, I'm keen to get more questions in, so can you have more hands, please? Can we have a lady in the, in the back in the, in the black jacket? Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Karis. I am a part of a grassroots campaign called the National um, Food Service, um, where we have been trying to like, gather support for our ideas of what we think a national food service would be. There are two strands to it. The first strand is communal eating spaces. Um, so the idea came from a project in Sheffield called Food Hall, where they provide a free or low-cost meal to people in the community. It's about social eating, it's about breaking down barriers, it's about everyone coming together and everyone's right to food. The second part is, as that gentleman said over there, about land, about increasing government subsidies for people to start community farms, local farms in their cities and areas. Um, and so it's like, like the Land Settlement Association. So that's what we've been working on. And do you have so a question? My two questions are, okay, why are there no food activists on this panel? Why are there no grassroots activists? I'm really sorry, but this... This is quite a shameful show. Like that guy's question would have been answered a lot long, a lot sooner. We have the support of the Green New Deal, and it, the Green New Deal is being really radical in this. And it's just a shame to see Sarah just with a load of people in suits. Thank you, uh, lady here in the stripy green and, and uh, grey jumper. Uh, second row back. Sorry. Thank you. Um, my name's Emily O'Brien. I work for Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, um, which is a local organisation, um, part of the Sustainable Food Cities Network that Ben has mentioned. And we take a joined up approach to food right across the systems. So that's working across food poverty, land use, as well as plant-based diets. And, uh, and my question is therefore, we've been plugging away at this for 10 years. Our, our um, Brighton Ho Food Strategy has 200 actions and 100 partners, including 26 separate council departments. We're really passionate about this, like many other areas. How can we have policy that um, supports the work that's going on on the ground by organisations like ourselves that have been leading away around this agenda for years and years now and make us more effective and make what we do roll out and be you know, as really as good as it can be. We really struggle with resources at the minute, so how can we get more help? And finally, gentlemen in the blue jacket. Thank you. Um, Owen Bennett from the Daily Telegraph. I just wanted to pick up Ben Reynolds' comment about uh, moving to a sort of opt-in system for meat uh, in certain situations. I just wondered, Sue, do you think that's something which should be broadened out to schools, hospitals, other places, so that actually vegetarian food should be the default there People should have to opt in for meat in those situations. Thank you. So I think that uh, Sue might take the first question on um, communal eating, national food service, and, and activism. Yes. yes. So I'm just going to um, <clears throat> confront that idea that just because I can put a jacket on to turn up to an event like this, I might not be a food activist. I think that's really simplistic. I took my wellies off yesterday to turn up here, and, uh, and I think there are, there are lots of people engaged in this debate, who managed to navigate the boundaries that otherwise get set up between us, the polarizing boundaries that get set up between us. What we need more of are spaces where we can find our common ground and can find that sense of shared purpose. Because while we argue with each other, the planet is continuing to burn. So I want to make a really, really strong um, plea that we, that we stop finding ways to set those boundaries up. I think the point that you make there is a brilliant one. And this is why we produced this report, which is um, it's the companion report to the kind of conventional set of proposals that we have in here. As we travel the country, talking to people in their communities, we found so many examples of people already doing things that are already bringing the future to life. Whatever the policy frameworks, um, exist around them. 
It's material right now because there's a great deal of investment, quite rightly, going into the development of a national food strategy. But any national strategy that's created in Whitehall will only ever be as good as the capacity for implementation at a local level. And that's why we talk in here about um, the, the role of community food plans, properly engaged community food plans. Cities like Brighton have got a fantastic history, and Bristol, and other places around the country. But they're not widespread, they're not uniformly applied, and we need to share, amplify, and illuminate those lessons learned so that we can uh, you know, grow that capacity for change from the ground up, as well as putting in the national frameworks that support it. Ben, are you happy to jump in on, on the answer to the question? Mm. Um, uh, I, I agree with your point. Uh, community food activists can come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, and I'm on a panel, so i am put my suit on today. Um, but I completely agree with your points. I think our national food service is really intriguing. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, communal eating spaces, I think, um, yeah, let's, 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 um, let's investigate more about what that could look like. Increasing subsidies for community farms, community food production. Um, so one of the things we did with around the Olympics was we saw this corporate roadshow coming into town. We thought, okay, well, let's get a bit back for the community. And so we went to different funders. Uh, we even managed to get some money at Boris Johnson at the time to fund community gardens in London. We supported uh, 3,000. To be honest, it was the gardens that did it. They set themselves up. We just gave them some money, some tools, some seeds, but the, all the impetus was with them, which was fantastic. Um, I wanted to answer Emily's point, actually, about how do we ensure that we get funding down to those groups that are doing that amazing work on the ground, that are supporting food activists but are trying to change food policy. I think there's something in the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, this is, uh, a lot of people won't know what this is. This is where all the EU money, the money that was going to the EU, is now going to go through this thing called the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Probably not as much, uh, and all of it is going to go through local economic partnerships, which are, by and large, opaque, undemocratically elected bodies. So all that money that would have gone to regional development funds, European social funds, uh, that would have gone to fishermen to repair nets or coastal paths. There's absolutely no clue, no plan on where that money is going to go. So I think there's a lot of groups out there that are saying, look, we need to know what the plans are for this UK Shared Prosperity Fund, and let's make sure it gets equity, equity, I can't, play, I can't say that, distributed throughout the country, and there's actually some say from people about where that money goes, and that it should go, I think some of that should be going on food, sustainable food projects, and, and certainly sustainable food partnerships like yours should have a say in that. Yeah, um, thanks. Emily, I, I actually visited um, in Bristol a kind of similar setup to what you're talking about, and I was so impressed. It was absolutely fantastic. And I think it's really important that we support organisations like yourself because it is, it is incredibly important work, what we're doing. And, and community food is it's, it's an important way that we need to be working together in order to support people with nutrition and education and, and, and all of that. Um, if you've got a strategy with 200 actions... I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Um, I'll give you my card afterwards, and if you could send it through, because Ben's mentioned our uh, food and uh, consultation uh, a couple of times now, um, which is why we've got uh, a debate on that uh, following the consultation in a conference on Tuesday. And then f uh, following that debate, basically, I, I will take all the contributions away and then from that, we'll be building our food and farming strategy. So I'd love to get some input from you on that, so, so thank you. Um, regarding Owen's question, I actually think that what we should be investing in, as I mentioned earlier, is education in healthy eating, and people understanding where their food comes from and the implications of that. And I think that that's, that's the focus we should have. We've got time for maybe a couple of final questions. Short questions and short answers, please, if that's okay. Um, can Do Thank you. You've had your chance to speak. Can I have the lady in red here with the short hair in the second row? Anybody wants to launch a microphone that way? That's it. Here. In this. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name's Emily. I'm from Lewis, just up the road. Um, I work to support um, three uh, local food banks in the town, and I run a community cafe, which is a similar idea to the Real Junk Food 
project in Brighton where we use surplus food to feed the community and you pay what you feel. Um, I spoke at a policy forum yesterday and the suggestion that, that I made there that I'd like you to hear um, is that we um, put a stop to best before dates. So I'll give you an example for why that is. Um, I um, teamed up with Nobly and I collect surplus food from supermarkets. Um, we know the impact of that on our carbon um, uh, footprint and basically the, the um, situation is that I picked up 95 mangoes in, wrapped in plastic. Um, I know this is very specific but I think it illustrates the point perfectly. One was supposedly ripe and ready to eat and one was ripened at home. I took them home, they sat on my windowsill for four days before they were ripe and they've been pulped and put in landfill. Um, that, to me, illustrates the problem with best before. Back in the day, probably before I was born, you would be able to pick something up, smell it, touch it, taste it, to see if that is sensible and safe to eat. And I know that in a commercial setting, in a restaurant, for example, that would be how you would test whether a food is safe to eat outside of use-by dates, which is a separate issue because of food hygiene and safety. So I would like to see a stop to the best before date for environmental reasons, reasons of food poverty and food waste um, and I would like to feed that into the discussion please. Thank you. In the white dress. Thank you um, Chair. Um, I'm Rachel Eden. Um, I'm a Labour's and cooperative parliamentary candidate uh, in the very marginal seat of Reading West. And um, just to say thank you for mentioning co-ops. I think they are a massive part of the solution. But we haven't got much time, and I want to speak a very personal issue. Um, my um, autistic daughter is frightened by a no-deal Brexit because of her limited food intake. And I think what we need to do is we need to tackle the divide that we have between, um, perhaps in the past, being the sort of idea that ethical food is a luxury for the middle classes um, and the issue of food poverty. And I, you're so right to mention that. Um, and, you know, I'm currently freezing apples from our apple tree so that she knows she's got vitamin C to eat after no deal Brexit because she needs that reassurance. What about the kids who I represent whose parents don't have an apple tree because they haven't got a garden? Do you want to go... Do you want to go first on Emily and food banks? Um, yes, Emily and food banks. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, one of the things that, that I want to look at within our development of our food strategy is labelling. Because I think the labelling in this country is very confusing um, it, right across the board. And I completely agree with you about best before. We have to tackle food waste. And one of the reasons... And, and when you actually look at food waste, the majority of it is thrown away at home. And best before dates, I believe, have something to do with it. And it also brings me back to my, what I keep going on about, which is education. We need to be better educated about food. I do exactly what you said. I look at the packet and go, oh, it looks all right. Have a quick sniff, have a quick look, stick your finger in it. Yeah, that'll do. You know, and I've never been poisoned yet by my own cooking. <laughs> I mean, still time, nor's my husband, I don't think. But um, no, absolutely right. So I... The work that people are doing in food banks is extraordinary and important, but we should not need food banks in the seventh richest economy in the world. It is a travesty that we are in that position. And do you know, I, I, I don't know what I can possibly say to you other than how on earth are we in this position when we are seriously considering how we're going to manage our food supplies in the event of a no-deal Brexit in six weeks' time, which would be an absolute, uh, absolute travesty for this country. I'm, I have no words for you. Um, I just wanted to respond, I think, to, the, to the, the second question about that, tackling the divide between ethical food and food poverty. It's, um, yeah, it's... For a lot of the progress we've seen in terms of the growth in the market for ethical food, it ha there is this divide appearing, and I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's something we really need to see stop. I'm not sure that this is the answer to it, but certainly some, one of the things that we're campaigning for, um, and there was a session on earlier today, is, uh, is a right to food. And I think seeing how that then cascades through um, making sure we make more of those, as I said earlier, the, the public sector settings to make sure that those people on a low income can get good quality food. But 
at the end of the day, wages is really the big thing. We, when we talk about food poverty, it's just poverty. Um, and, I, and I think we should really be starting with the food sector. Food and farming and all its related industries uh, employs one in eight people, uh, working people in this country. It's the single largest sector. So we should be really focusing on making sure, and a lot of those work, a lot of those uh, jobs in those, um, in those trades are, are low paid. We have situations where we have uh, supermarket workers going to food banks. This is absolutely ridiculous, absolutely inex inexcusable. So I mean, one of the things that we'd call for, and I'd, I'd really like to see Labour embrace, not only is embracing a real living wage, but particularly um, starting with the food sector and saying, okay, how can we, um, set, sector by sector within that, whether that's farming, manufacturing, retail, catering, um, be pushing more and more of those employers towards paying the, the real living wage. Well, we're nearly out of time, um, so it leaves just for me to say uh, thank you uh, to Sarah for hosting. Um, I don't know who knows, but Sarah uh, has been around since 1973. They are the Social Society for the Environment uh, with Labour, which means that if you strike me as the sort of people who might want to influence Labour policy, and if you do, joining Sarah is quite a straight route uh, to, to being able to influence policy. Um, I'm on the executive, I chat with Sue quite regularly, it's a, it's a short route. So do consider joining Sarah if you haven't already. Um, thank you to all our fantastic panellists, please give them a hand. <laughs>